Uh, this is going to be a very different talk than the last talk, so uh, apologies. But uh, you know, one thing I think that is becoming much more clear in the multi rollup world is uh, is that auctions are a lot harder in in crypto. And one question is, how do you actually design these in uh, I just use a dongle. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Cross-chain auctions, hard sort of mechanisms to design, uh, so let's kind of see why. So crypto has had a very long-standing tradition of being intertwined with auctions, uh, whether they're off-chain or on-chain. The very brief history of famous auctions in crypto, uh, of course, the Silk Road Bitcoin was maybe one of the first big auctions. The second was, you know, Gnosis had an uh, on-chain Dutch auction. Polkadot's ICO had an, a Dutch auction that was, you know, used by hundreds of thousands of people. Flashbots, January 2021 uh, for the first bundle. And then NFT auctions have had a bunch of in incentive changes in design since then. So a natural question is, why are auctions important in crypto? Uh, well, they're mechanisms for, for price discovery of scarce goods. So you might say, why do auctions or how do auctions facilitate price discovery? Uh, and you know, the, the simplest explanation is that if we look at the social welfare of all market participants, so that's all the buyers, that's all the sellers, it's maximized when the person who wins sort of pays a cost equivalent to the externality they cause on all the other users. So, you know, if, uh, you know, the, the winning bidder by winning the item causes, you know, someone else to, ha to have sort of like a loss in utility, they have to compensate them for it. And auctions are actually, it turns out, one of the unique mechanisms for, for achieving that. But the real hard part in designing these is that you don't really know everyone's utility. So I can't exactly say how to compensate for these negative externalities. Moreover, they're, they're quite adversarial. The, the buyers and sellers are incentivized to, to be duplicitous. So, you know, if you look at value that exists on the internet right now, one of the largest sort of places that you see financial transactions are in auctions, whether it's online ad auctions, whether it's sort of collectible auctions. Notice the, the, the thing I, ha I have here ends in 2019, so it's obviously a lot higher now with NFTs. On the other hand, centralized entities are very famous for manipulating their auctions. So this is directly from the Department of Justice's case against Google from you know, a few weeks ago uh, about how Google basically front run people on their own auction. Uh, and, you know, it, it was a case that took 10 years to prove, partially because you have to figure out that people are manipulating the auction indirectly from observing you know, many years of, of interactions. It's not, it wasn't obvious that it's like, hey, they have a big red button that says manipulate. Uh, and so it's a very complicated case. But one of the most interesting things is that these centralized auctions are often you know, really, really manipulated. So one question is, you know, where, you know, when we think about things like MEV, which, you know, is one of the most used auctions on, in crypto, you might ask, is there a way to get around some of these problems and can we have the same volume of value transfer uh, but without actually having to deal with some of these issues with centralized players? And what we're going to kind of explore today a little bit is, A, in a world with many, many domains or chains, uh, the types of auctions you can build are quite complex, but with uh, you know using newer technologies, whether it's uh, zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, 
we can actually get to a place where these auctions are, you know, in, in a very concrete sense, fair and hard to manipulate. And in a lot of ways, the goal of, of you know, technology and cryptocurrencies to, to reduce these negative externalities. Okay, so I'm assuming sort of a more general audience. So I, many of you may already know about the, the main on-chain auctions in crypto, but I figured we'll give a quick summary. So the, 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 the main auctions on chain are liquidations within DeFi. So when you have underwater debt positions that need to be cleared out, uh, large transactions, so like when a DAO wants to sell a large portion of its treasury, NFT secondary sales, of course, that's sort of a famous example, and then minor extractable value, maximal extractable value. Uh, another question you might ask is what types of auction formats are used? Uh, so, you know, you have your MEV auctions with Slashbots, first price auctions. You have Dutch auctions. Uh, so, you know, for instance, some DeFi protocols use Dutch auctions for, for clearing. Dutch auctions are descending price auctions um, and, you know, are named due to the tulips uh, in the 19th century. Uh, the third type of auction format you see on chain is sequential auction. So that's editions of NFTs, sequences of NFTs. Um, and the fourth, which is the one that I think we're, we're starting to see, uh, are combinatorial auctions, which are order flow auctions. So the title of the talk said, why are cross-chain auctions hard? So now that we've sort of walked through where the auctions are, I think it's worth trying to understand explicit examples of where cross-chain auctions are significantly more difficult than single-chain auctions. And we're going to go through one example, which is cross-chain bid splitting. So the way this works is, suppose we have two chains, let's say, I don't know, Optimism and Arbitrum, and we're trading the asset you're paying gas in and on one chain, we have a version of the native asset, X, and the synthetic asset, Y. Uh, and on the other chain, we have a synthetic version of X and the underlying true version of Y. And someone observes a sort of DEX ARB. So there's a price of uh, you know, X to Y on chain X, and there's a price of X to Y on chain Y. Now remember, on chain X, you pay for gas in X, chain Y, you pay for gas and Y. So you have these sort of two parallel universes that are supposed to be synchronized by arbitrage. So how do you actually get to, to sort of the optimal arbitrage? So you may say, OK, I'll sell some unit set of unit, some amount of X uh, to get synthetic Y. I take the synthetic Y to the other chain, and I get some amount of real units of Y. And then I go backwards. So we, you close the arbitrage by, by going backwards. The idea is that on chain X, you incur this slippage defined by this function A. On chain Y, you incur the slippage defined by this function B. So think of those as like the price impact function. So in Uniswap, for instance, the price impact function is one over the reserves minus the trade size squared. So now you say, OK, well, well, how is this profitable? So the key thing when actually thinking about the auction design here is that you have to include many factors. First factor is the gas cost. That's GX and G. The second factor is the actual bids. And this is where this gets quite complicated. Do I bid in X units? Do I bid on optimism for the right to do the arbitrage? Do I bid on Arbitrum or do I bid on them separately? And it turns out that all three of these give you different outcomes. So what I mean by that is you can actually write out the profit, expected profit for, for these two things. So on the optimism to arbitrum leg and the arbitrum to optimism leg. But there's this very, very weird thing. When you execute your trade, you're actually causing the gas price on the remote chain to change implicitly relative to the in input token. So I, you know, I sell OP, I get some, well, non-existent RB, uh, and I push the Arbitrum price up. Now the question is, how much should I bid for that? Because I've actually made my arbitrage more expensive in some sense. And so you can design an auction where 
you bid on each chain separately, like I have a Flashbots auction for Optimism, a Flashbots auction for Arbitrum, or you could have a sort of consolidated one over the shared validator set or shared sequencer, you may bid on the whole bundle. And so a natural question to ask is, is it better to bid uh, in two auctions for each leg separately for, for the, the Optimism side and the Arbitrum side? Or should you actually bid on both simultaneously? And the, the most interesting answer is that it actually very much depends on the particular market makers and the, the slippage you have. There's no unique best auction. So what this says is that in the cross-chain world, if I try to design an MEV auction that's meant to have certain properties, say, maximizing revenue for validators or is efficient to clear, like it's, it's easy for people to figure out how to participate, then it depends on the actual applications. For each application, a particular auction format will work best. This is sort of a, 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 an impossibility result. There's sort of not a unique best optimal cross-chain auction because you can always construct these examples where on one chain, you're actually impacting the gas price on the other chain, and then you get this feedback loop between them, and the auction, it's not clear how to actually design the best auction. So you might say, OK, this is a pretty bad result in some ways. It means that there's not like a perfect setup. But the difference is you, know, you can actually have pretty good auctions by, by having the single auctions on each chain. Uh, there's a certain sense in which they approximate what the optimal revenue is. Uh, but the real question is what happens if the auctioneer, the validators, the sequencers are actually manipulating the outcome of the auction? And so one other sort of desirable property for cross-chain auctions is that the validators, the sequencers, cannot manipulate the actual outcome of the auction. So in a normal MEV auction, say, on Flashbots, you could imagine that we have a bunch of different fo people with different value distributions. So you know, we have the, this first individual to the bottom left. They have sort of this bell curve value distribution for their transactions. We have the second person uh, whose value is sort of uh, this kind of decaying value. And then we have this third person who has sort of these like fat tailed values. And the idea is each person's, you know, for, for how much they want to bid in the auction, they draw a value and then they submit their bid and maybe they'll get the milady here. So what it means for an auction to be credible is that the auctioneer actually runs the mechanism. So it's first price auction, second price auction, clock auction, whatever it is. And even if they add fake bids, or they lie, or they manipulate the auction, they can only decrease their revenue. They can never increase the amount of money they make by spoofing bids, or wash trading, or, or adding in fake transactions. And you might say, OK, this is a great property in crypto. This is, in fact, the thing that the Department of Justice accuses Google of doing, which is front running everyone on their own auction. So if you can actually achieve that in, in crypto, that's a unique value proposition that you just don't have in the centralized web, where you actually know for a fact that an auctioneer who you're buying something from is not front running you. And so, you know, two papers that kind of came out very recently. One says censorship resistance uh, in these types of auctions requires multiple proposers. This probably doesn't come as a big surprise to anyone who, who is a, a critic of the fact that there's only one sequencer on Arbitrum and Optimism right now. On the other hand, uh, the other paper from us shows that if you use ZK proofs, if you use commitments, you can actually achieve this credible credibility property, in, which is extremely important, which means that even if you know, someone does front run you or sandwich attack you in Flashbots, you can actually have a ton of proof that the person who's running it, the validator, is not cheating uh, in, in exactly the same way that Google was cheating at, and the Department of Justice is sort of accusing them of. So I think, you know, to, to, to keep this short, blockchains, they're great public broadcast mechanisms. And these public broadcast mechanisms are actually really good ways to ensure that market participants aren't cheating you and that publicly 
you can validate that they're not cheating you. This sort of means that all these properties that people have wanted from certain types of mechanisms like fair auctions can only sort of happen uh, in blockchains. Uh, and the real question is, can we actually get all of these properties we want? We want credibility, the auctioneers can't cheat. We want them to be sort of roughly fair across different chains. We want high revenue. Uh, and we're just not, you know, these are kind of the, the main open questions left. Um, so with that, I actually have a lot of time for questions. So if anyone wants, has any questions, that is the end. I'll repeat your question once you... Actually, I think he's going to get you. How do you ensure credibility in gradual Dutch auctions? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, good question. Uh, there is a way to do that. Uh, I basically the idea in those auctions is you want you need the auctioneer to have no incentive to basically buy early auctions, push the price up, and then force everyone to buy above that floor. And the way you do that is you force the auctioneer to hold inventory. So they have to actually be holding goods, which means they're holding risk. And if the price goes down, then they actually are take the loss. So there's sort of this risk reward trade off between the auctioneer and the buyer for those, those auctions. If, if not, then oh. What are some of the interesting auctions that you're looking at now? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think one of the kind of uh, interesting things to look at is, you know, the order flow auction in Flashbots, which is sort of a way of matching people who are, you know, say wallets who want to sell order flow to searchers and then split some of the profits with them. These order flow auctions are significantly more complicated than the current set of auctions, whether it's single block auctions like block that block builders participate in, or whether it's sort of these, you know, the traditional like I send you a bundle and you know we see the validator finds a way of sequencing the bundle. The reason for that is these order flow auctions are extremely high dimensional. It, it, it really depends on a lot of different factors because you, you're matching many different types of searchers with validators and you can have these very weird loops where one person actually does aggregate all the order flow in them. So making them incentive compatible is really hard. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the big problems in MEV in the next six months is that order flow auctions are sort of this thing that is really complicated but actually will help wallet UX a lot and definitely help wallets have sustainability. Uh, how do you think ERC4337 bundlers are going to play into OFAs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there's sort of a, a question of like what other types of transaction, what other types of signature en encodings you can use. So for instance, if I was able to actually have 4337 bundles that were encrypted prior to execution, I could encrypt it in a certain way, like, like these commitment type of schemes. You can hopefully avoid some of the DOS vectors and centralization vectors of the bundlers. Uh, sorry, to give, to, to give a bit more context, in EIP 4337, uh, bundlers take transactions from users and submit them on their behalf in a way that, that they, can't mani they can't really change them, but it allows the bundler or the application to pay gas for the user. So it sort of makes a large UX shift. Um, one question you might ask is, well, what, how does MEV work in that case? You know, do those bundlers participate in these auctions or do they just forward it to searchers? And I think you you need to come to a, a place where the bundlers actually don't provide all the information to the searchers. They just say like, here's some metadata of this set of transactions and you can bid on it, but I'm not actually giving you the full set of transactions prior to uh, 
inclusion in an order flow auction. Otherwise, the bundlers can get front run themselves quite a bit, and you, yeah, it might not work out super well. Uh, th there's a bunch of people who've analyzed these DOS vectors against 4337 that might be worth looking at. I think that's it, and with 38 seconds left.